Welcome back. If you're just joining, you're watching Daybreak on Trust TV. And of course, this is the discussion segment of the program. Now, despite the numerous assurances by President Bola Ahmed Tunibu that the fuel subsidy is gone, Daily Trust finding shows that the federal government paid $169.4 billion as subsidy in August to keep the pump price at 620 naira per litre. Now, this has led to several reports suggesting that the current price stagnation, despite the worsening exchange rate and international crude price crossing $95 a barrel, suggest a return of the subsidy. The escalating cost of living disproportionately affects individuals and families with limited financial means. Those living below the poverty line face tremendous difficulties in accessing amenities and meeting their daily needs. The vulnerable populations, including low-income earners, the unemployed and the rural dwellers are particularly susceptible to the adverse effects of rising prices, often being forced to choose between essential items such as food and education. One of the primary factors contributing to the rising cost of living, of course, in Nigeria is inflation. In recent years, the nation has experienced persistent inflationary pressures leading to higher prices for essential goods and services. The cost of food, housing, transportation, healthcare, and education has significantly increased, placing an immense burden on the average Nigerian. Now, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, Nigerian Consumer Price Index surged to 22.79% in the month of June, driven by a rise in the prices of food. Now, joining us in the studio this morning are Mr. Jide Ojo, a public affairs analyst and Professor Uche Waleke, President, Association of Capital Market Academics of Nigeria, to look at how the cost of living is becoming unbearable. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Now, let me start with you, Prof, because you so when we talk numbers, of course, you're the guy. So the figures have been reeled out. What's your take? Yeah, Saki. Uh, well, um, I think you've um, done a good job of um, providing the background. Uh, but I, I was listening to you. You gave a June figure. Yes. We course. even have a latest uh, number that is way, way higher than the 22 uh, uh, that you mentioned, and that's for the month of August. The latest figure by an MBS for month of August, you know, talks about 25.8 percent inflation rate. Mm. Okay, and that is even talking about the average movement in the price level, the one we call headline inflation. Okay, when you look at the food component of that, the food component of that, on the average, again, we are told is 29.8. You know that what? 30 percent. Okay, and if you also take that figure, um, if you disaggregate it according to states, MBS says that inflation rate in states like Kogi, for example, is as high as 38%. That's the food inflation. So that tells you that there is, real, there is a real challenge, um, especially when the pressure is coming on the food. And that is why you find a lot of people going through um, serious... Um, um, hardship. Mm. A lot of people can no longer feed because whatever they are earning, particularly the fixed income earners, of course you know the implication. Inflation reduces the purchasing power of the Naira. And there are people that will even tell you that what the MBS is releasing is merely an official figure. That it does not even reflect the reality. In other words, that the MBS figure is understated. Take for example, you go to the market uh, to buy, whether it's um, uh, Indomie, or whether it's uh, Mudu of Kari, or whether it's, it's Yam. Okay, you now realize that the price of these things keep rising eventually on a weekly basis. And that is why t today, people hardly go to the market with a list. You know, you, know, you, you normally would do a list and say, I want to buy of Yam, I'll get it for 1000 it, it, it doesn't have, because when you go to the market, what you see is a different um, reality. And to make matters worse, sellers, those who sell, especially uh, if you go to, if you walk into a grocery shop, for example, they will tell you that their pricing system is no longer based on cost plus markup. You know, if you bought something for, say, 100 naira, and you, as a businessman, you want your markup to be 20%. 
or 10 percent so you would tell at 110 naira yeah. if it is um uh, 10 percent but these days they no longer do cost plus markup what they do is cost plus markup plus replacement cost because they will tell you that by the time they go to you know restock the price must have increased so all these are really complicating the you know the uh, the hardship you know in the land all right you know inflation rate is calculated I said we calculated year on year. Year on year means uh, compared to this time the previous year. So if they tell you that inflation rate is 25.8, for example, as MBS is saying, in August, it means that between August of 2022 and August of 2023, prices on the average have increased by just 25%. And people are saying that is not the reality. Hmm. For many items, people can think of price must have gone as high as some 40%, some mm. 50%. That is not just 25 25%. So, so in a nutshell, uh, Sagi, there is, uh, inflation is, is, is a real problem. And a lot of people are going through hardship today because of inflation. And let me um, end this uh, you know, first segment, or rather my opening remarks, by saying that if you look at what's happening across the world now, in developed economies, US for example, the Eurozone for example, Inflation rate is actually trending downwards, okay, despite the Ukraine, you know, Russian conflict. The U.S. is almost getting close to the central bank's um, Federal Reserve's target, long-run target of 2%. And that's why the Federal Reserve is considering now pausing their interest rate hikes, okay. In South Africa, again, inflation rate is also trending down to close to 5%. The South African Reserve Bank has a target of between 3 and um, 6%. Yeah. But what is happening in our own case? it is more, more like uh, going up. And that's because of the sudden removal of first subsidy. So it's on the okay. back of the sudden removal of first subsidy. That all of this is premised. Uh, exactly. All right, public affairs analyst, Mr. Gidi Ojo, as well, political analyst. I need you to lend your voice to what he said, because one key thing I picked out you know, of um, his statement is the fact that the figures being reeled out by the National Bureau of Statistics is not really representative of the current realities being faced by Nigeria. Now, for the sake of our viewers, I want to give another rundown of the statistics. 70% of Nigerians live below the poverty line. Um, this is according to figures gotten from the National Bureau of Statistics as well as the World Bank. Um, inflation rate in Nigeria is at a 17-year high of 22.7%. 9%. That was for July. And Prof just corrected me that it's around 25.8% in August. The cost of food has increased by over 40% in the past year. The cost of transportation has increased by over 30% in the past year. And the cost of housing has increased by over 20% in the past year as well. So, Gide Ojo, what do you have to say to all this? Uh, thank you very much. Back at uh, to all our Muslim faithfuls. Um, the situation is quite very dire. I mean, I won't go to the figures. Prof has already done justice to that. The reality of our existence is that um, life is becoming more brutish, nasty, and short. Uh, we are back to the Obesian state of nature. Uh, and you could see the reaction. Um, it is said that water will must find its level. So there is increase in banditry, in kidnapping, in all manner of vices, because people just want to make money at all costs. If you look at the number of youths engaged in Yahoo Yahoo or Yahoo Plus, whatever they call it, which is internet fraud, it's exponentially increasing. If EFCC tells you that uh, this year they've recorded uh, 5,000 convictions, ask them for a breakdown. Two thirds of those who are convicted are internet, you know, fraudsters. Because many more people are taken to vices as a means of surviving. People are cutting corners. We have not talked about rent. Many who are into micro, small, and medium enterprises now. For instance, I work from home. I can't afford an office. Maybe a prof has one. Of course, Nasara State University will give it. <laughs> and then they will have uh, one from uh, Capital Market. Uh. But people like me, who is considered an average, you know, uh, middle class, I could not afford to rent an office. 
So what do I do? As a cost, cost, cost cutting measure, I have to be working from home. So <laughs> that is the innovative ways to survive. Now, many people cannot pay rent. Uh, they cannot pay school fees. This is month of September. If, you, if we are a research-based economy, we will have seen the number of students and pupils that are dropping out of school. All because the cost of there is rising cost of living. Now, is it this current administration? Yes or no? We all know the burden of subsidy was becoming too unbearable. How could we be spending as much as our capex, capex, that is capital expenditure framework, to subsidize one product? Seven trillion was spent on subsidy last year. Mm. This year, in 2023 budget, they said they are spending 3.5 trillion. Not on petrol subsidy, or not on petroleum products, just so petrol. As in one single, because there is no subsidy on kerosene, no subsidy on jet one, no subsidy on diesel. Yes, so on one product, assuming you now want to subsidize all the petroleum products, that means you will not even have an economy again. So I feel this old blame, yes, it's on subsidy, but where I blame the incumbent administration is there was supposed to be a one month window. The subsidy regime for 2023 covers up to June. The end of June. End of June. Where did you have to remove it on May 29 and set the economy into spiral reaction? That one month could have been used to negotiate with labor unions to think through what will be the economic relief packages you want to do and all of that. Because as we speak now, now labor unions are threatening to go on indefinite strike, maybe from next week. They've gone on protests, they've gone on two-day warning strike earlier this month. And that is the natural reaction. Because we have, we have treaded this road before. It's not like this is the first time. And mark you, when we are saying petrol subsidy has been removed, it's back. What has happened now is just that the quantum of resources being used for subsidy has reduced. Because from your opening remarks, if this is your newspaper, 1000 to a dollar, and this is a product that you have to import. So when you import, the landing cost, insurance, demorage, uh, logistics, haulage, um, and all of that, you cannot still be buying at 610 10 naira per liter in Abuja. It was the labor unions that saved the day for many Nigerians when they said any one carbon increase on this amount will be met with immediate downing of tools. And that's when our jury came out and said, oh, we are not contemplating increasing the price of uh, PMS. But while they are not increasing, where we are now is very unpalatable situation. And what needs to be done? Because we need to start thinking through what is the way out. The, 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 what I foresee now is unless government, now that the cabinet has been formed, we have the Minister of uh, Economy and uh, Coordinating Minister for Economy and Minister of Finance, we have the cabinet more or less in place. It's for them to now take quick actions. The three billion they went to borrow from Afrexim Bank in Egypt is not doing any magic now. Because what they thought they were going to do with that three billion dollars was to show up the value of the Naira. It has not worked. And meanwhile, Dangote Petroleum released a statement two days ago that they, could, they have to import crude for their first consignment of uh, refinement because NMPCL has committed the crude that is being, uh, uh, you know, explored now up through to November to paying back what we borrowed from Avrexin. 
But can we look at cost saving measures that can impact on the economy? I I for the for my for, for the life of me, I don't know whether I prof has why would we have a cabinet of this size? I mean, so that's of 50, that's 50 ministers in the midst of all of this. Does it make sense? We are creating additional ministry. We were supposed to run a lean government, smart government, not to have a bloated. Now we have um, 45 were inaugurated. Two additional has been named. There are still like two or three states that are yet Kaduna hasn't yes, gotten his own ministerial slot. Minister. <laughs> so at the end of the day, we may end up with 50 ministers, and that's not the size of the cabinet. So, so Mr. Jide, putting all of this in perspective now, I mean, all of these ministers use vehicles, of course. And Is it only vehicles? vehicles? What about AIDS? They have, of course, I was getting to that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long and very wide convoy. But not the president convoy alone, I was talking to um, the State House correspondent the other day. He said sometimes it spans up to 70 cars sometimes. I, I, don't know, I don't know how true that is. But then again, if you calculate the cost of fueling just vehicles alone, Mr. GD, I want you to speak to reducing the cost of governance. See, Sergei, I write column for the punch for the past 11 years. There is nothing I've not said. There is nothing I'm saying now that I've not documented in black and white. We know what to do, but the political way to just do it is what's lacking. Even the old brother about subsidy removal, we have what we could have learned from. So, in, in short words, we are supposed to reduce cost of governance. The only thing I've seen Tinubu did was to reduce the number of delegates to UN General Assembly. What did that save us? How many, how many thousands of dollars did that save us? We are supposed to reduce the cost of governance through reduction in the size of ministries, departments, and agencies. Through, you know, looking at how do we fund the budget, plug the loopholes. Because even as we speak, there's a lot of leakages in the system. There's a lot of fraud that is going on. With all the multi-billion dollar surveillance contract, we are still losing, according to official figure from NSA, we are still losing 400,000 barrels of crude oil to thieves in the Niger Delta region. If you block that alone, look at the revenue because even as we speak we must also look at the international price of crude has increased 95 dollars we, we should be we should be celebrating because at some point it came to about 30 25 dollars now we as we, the, the, we, we as should be selling more but azumi sagir azumi we are able to meet our open quota of 1.8 million barrels per day that will have brought in more money for the economy to run the economy. Now, some people, a Kaba is behind this oil theft. The president, in over 110 days or almost 120 days, has not been able to stop that. Two, the leakages within the system, revenue collection agencies, there are still a lot of them that are not remitting to a federation account. But and it's in trillions. Committee was set up. Oh, well, committees have been set up of in time past. Of course. What have they been able to achieve? A lot of leakages. This one will collect rent, put operations up. In fact, they, they are the ones that even determine their own wages. <laughs> a corporation under mm. government would say, this is how much we will have. Levy, the levy will. So, so Prof is, is, a, is a lecturer, but so, somebody working in CBN, NCC, FRS is not handling the same as somebody who works in the mainstream Ministry of Finance. You, you get, they get Jumbo pay because they are revenue generating agencies and they do not remit whatever they feel like into the Federation account. So there, is, there, are, there are still a lot of leakages. I know a committee has been to, to do tax reform has been set up. The, I'm, I'm not sure what timeline they have to submit their report. Is the chairman that has been made chairman of uh, FRS, uh, Zaki Osadedeja, I guess. Uh, no, no uh, this guy, Oyedele, Tai Oyedele. Now, all of this, if we are able to keep eye on the ball, 
I have set timeline and block leakages within the system, the corruption that is still taking place, the huge revenue loss that we are seeing curing, and then widen our tax base. Like the president said, it's not increasing tax, but tax to GDP is still the least in the world, if not maybe in Africa, if not in the world. So we still have like about five, six percent of tax when some European countries are doing like 40% of their GDP being from tax. So a lot of people are not paying tax. There are issues around waivers where people get huge waivers and still their products are not cheap. Hmm. How can you? How can you? How can you Prof, be getting a huge waiver from government why, why, and why, your product is, is still most expensive? Why, why is the situation like this? Because, <laughs> like Mr. Jide raised the front page of the Daily Trust, and it's clearly written: Naira crosses one thousand Naira per dollar in the black market. Why are we st still talking black market uh, CBN price, despite the fact that the Naira, you know, has been floated? And of course, what is the expected reactions to follow? in relation to the economy following, you know, this. Uh, thanks, Sergei. Uh, before I come to this um, exchange rate matter, let me say that um, um, the president, as you know, um, I think he's still in the U.S. Um, in his address uh, uh, to the General, General Assembly. Assembly, you know, he, he talked about that um, it's not about whether or not, let me try to quote him, it's not about so whether or not so let me mention the five key points so that can help. No, I just want to use right. this particular one. Right, it's not about whether or not the country is open to business. Mm. Uh, but it is more about how many um, uh, you know, uh, people in the international community are willing, willing to, to do business, do with, Nigeria. business with Nigeria. Okay? Um, uh, so he said uh, something in that direction. So the point to note here is that Anybody who is willing to do business with Nigeria will, of course, be watching, you know, the situation in Nigeria to be able to know whether to, um, you know, come in. And is it looking nice? <laughs> is, this, does, is the situation looking good <laughs> at the moment? Nice yes, so well, well, let Prof answer yes. the question, of yes, course. Yes. So that's, that's one thing. Then the, the other thing, too, I, I need to say has to do with um, the fact that labor, yes, is, um, I think the ultimatum ends, uh, ended yesterday or so. Um, I would advise that um, um, I don't think this is the time to embark on strike because it will further compound, you know, the situation. It will complicate things. Uh, right now, the government is saying that um, they um, have in place, you know, one or two uh, palliatives, you know, to be able to ameliorate the um, uh, yes the hardship. Now. These measures that they have are going to be implemented by ministry, government, and agencies, uh, and so on. So, if you have a strike, okay, and um, you know government organs are short, uh, banks, you know, are short, it will also affect the implementation of the um, of whatever measures the government um, has, okay. But having said that, it's also important talking about um, you know cost of uh, governance. Um, he made a very valid point that there is need to reduce the cost of governance. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any, anybody can really rationalize the uh, unwieldy, because that's where I des describe it, unwieldy number of ministries, you know, that we have now. Um, let, last um, check, 48. So that's too, you know, uh, too high. So wh wh while we are saying that, yes, the first subsidy removal, by the way, I support it. Um, he also has given a due argument why you know we, we shouldn't continue along that path, uh, and of course, part of what we're experiencing now, you know, are the fallouts of that uh, subsidy model. So if the government is saying, okay, these uh, things will happen in the in the short run, let's all endure, people are also watching to see what those of them over there are also doing to demonstrate that we are all in the same boat, mm -hmm. whether at the executive level, at the national assembly level, or even the judiciary, and in fact at all levels of the government. So what are they doing on their own part to also show that, yes, we are in the, in the same boat? So it's not a, a case of let the, the people there. He was talking about middle class. The, the unfortunate thing is that we don't even have the middle, middle class has, um, has a disappeared. Has out. Yes. So it's either you are there, or you, or are you are, you are, 
yes. So those of them that are in government, those of them that are the executive I'm in particular, should demonstrate, you know, show. Uh, and one, one way to do that is to evidently um, also show um, that you are reducing cost of governance, okay? At the state level, for example, we read, we read about governors who have appointed so many aides, okay? Uh, all in the Let's name of uh, to furniture allowances. Exactly. All in the name of all in the name of uh, engaging um, youth. That's mm -hmm. not the way to provide jobs for the youth because such jobs you are doing, the jobs in quote, are not sustainable. When you say you are providing jobs because you are appointing, you know. Uh, all right. Thousands. Well, let, let's ask the ultimate question. Yes. I mean, we have seen, you know, the the government promising a future. Most of it is like a long term. Uh, you know, plan saying that this is what we're planning, we're going to see. And the short plan, the short term plan they have actually started implementing is about the palliatives. And already we are seeing a lot of situations on that palliative uh, thing when we're seeing some states are being hoarding this particular thing. So exactly. the fear of Nigeria is already happening that yes. this thing might not really. Get to those. Get to the people. So yes. it couldn't really solve the short term goal. Yes. And the NLC, TUC are hovering at hitting the government saying, okay, we need you people to do something. So the ultimate question is, can minimum wage be increased? And if it can, how possible and how much do you think it will in order to at least help the people of the country? Because we know that the suffering is too much. Yeah, We're talking about liquefied <laughs> gas increasing. It's yes. only on the food stuff anymore. Yes. It's so around what 18 million is, uh, naira per metric ton. Yeah, exactly. so uh, you can say that again. People are going through, you know, a, a you know, really tough uh, um, situation, tough patch. Um, can minimum wage help? Yes. It, it, to a large extent, yes. Um, it can. But remember again that minimum wage is only uh, with reference to those who are in, but working, especially who work in, in government. You have so many people out there who are, uh, especially in the informal sector, Okay, because this minimum wage, at the end of the day, it, it will simply cover those in government and possibly some in the organized uh, private, private sector. sector. But we have a whole lot of people who are in the informal sector. We have a whole lot of people who are unemployed. Unemployed and vulnerable. And vulnerable. So these ones will not benefit from minimum wage. But yes, minimum wage, um, the 5,000 Naira today is highly, highly, you know, unrealistic. Uh, of course, it's just one of the uh, uh, packages. Okay, the government has talked about getting in um, 3,000 uh, CNG, you know, gas-powered uh, buses, 20 star buses, uh, between now and March next year. Um, and number one, I think, well, why that is good, I think it's, it's not um, it's sufficient. I also think uh, they should also add, in addition to buses, there should be um, intra-city taxi cabs, okay, and as well as trucks, all right, and utility vehicles, particularly to convey goods, um, farm produce, from farm gates to the market. If you look at this inflation thing we're talking about today, food inflation, in, if you check the National Bureau of Statistics figure, it is 38% in Kogi, and elsewhere in Sokoto is around 21%. So it tells you that there, there is also a connection with transport, that if you can have, um, uh, you know, low cost of transport. So it's possible to move these goods from places where they are cheap, you know, to places where they are very high, to even out that wide um, disparity. If you, if you look at the MBS, um, again, um, report on GDP yeah. for second quarter, it says that the transport, transport GDP decreased sharply, fell by as much as minus 50% following the removal of first stops. So it tells you that there's a problem with transport. So government, um, the idea of bringing in mass transit buses, as I said, is good, but we should increase the number. We should also, um, you know, uh, look at other things, apart from buses, taxis for intra-city, as well as um, trucks and utility vehicles, all right? Since we don't have um, rails, you know, functional rail service system, you know, at the moment. Then they're also talking about um, interventions in SMEs, you know. Um, again, the size of those interventions, in my view, are not, um, uh, the size, you know, is not something that is significant, okay? Uh, they're also talking about um, what they want to do in, in agriculture. In all of this, it will require money. So where will that money come from, all right? So I think that we are losing opportunities in, um, that are being presented now from the 
rise in crude oil price. Just as I said, crude oil price is now above $95 per barrel. And yet, we cannot meet our um, OPEC quota. OPEC quota for us is 1.74 million barrels per day, excluding con condensates. Okay? But what we are doing at the moment, according to the recent OPEC report, is just 1.2 million barrels per day. So you have a deficit of over 500,000 uh, barrels per day. Multiply that by, even, even if you use $90, $90 per barrel, you get um, uh, you know, over, over $1 billion. What we are losing, you know, um, in, wow. in a month, because 500,000 barrels times that, that days gives you 15 million barrels. Mm. So imagine what 1 trillion Naira can do, I mean, if you convert it to Naira, you know, can do in this kind of um, a situation. So it can be used to ramp up some of these interventions that we are, you know, uh, talking about. I'm saying that that money can be found, especially when we are serious about dealing with crude oil, you know, crude oil theft, because that's the major challenge where we are not meeting our um, OPEC quota. So, right. so, so, so that's the, that's the point. Um, I am saying that the government should move very fast with respect to these interventions and the palliatives. And again, moving away from cash, um, you know, related um, uh, palliatives, you okay. know, uh, cash transfers, that has not worked, you know, uh, it, you know it's fraught with a lot of um, uh, the corruption and so Indeed. on, Indeed. you know, to things that will really reduce out-of-pocket expenses. Okay. I give example, in the education sector, for example, he has noted that this is a period you know, where parents worry about, you know, payment of school fees. So governments can actually take it, take it, take it, um, you know, take it up, and um, uh, make these things free from primary school to SS. Uh, just CBS like Soluto yes. just did. Yes. Uh -huh. So there should be free education, and that free education should shouldn't just stop at paying fees because parents worry about money to uh, buy books and and uh, procure uniforms. Okay. So you make those things available now. You have reduced their out of pocket expense, and they will worry about that. Okay. In the case of health, you also make free. Um, Primary, you know, yeah, exactly. primary health care. A lot of people today are not part of the national health insurance scheme, so people worry about what they, you know, when they pay out um, what they, what out of pocket expense. When you reduce that, you minimize the impact of this um, subsidy. That's the best way to do that. Okay, so not paying ten thousand naira as some states are doing, adding ten thousand naira to salaries of civil servants. All that, right, that won't go. So All right. So we are yes. pressed for time. I really wish I could get Mr. Judas. But let, let me quickly chip in something. In that minute, even sir. though we we, we, yes. we 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 are out of time, you see. All of these things are interconnected, but what I will advise, in addition to what uh, my girlfriend friend has said, is the need to fight insecurity. All right. You cannot attract foreign direct investment if the situation is appalling, if you have an insecure environment, and even the food security you are talking about. Many people who are supposed to be on their central farmlands making food for the com consumption of the rest of us who are in urban centers are moving to Abuja, moving to city centers because of bandits. And there was uh, a recent attack on farmers also in uh -huh. Exactly. So yeah, on, yeah. until when you deal with all of these indices, when you make the country secure, investors will come because okay. we have the market. 200 okay. million people, you know, who have to feed. Okay. But if the environment is not secure for people to practice whether subsistence or mechanized Commercial. farming, yeah. uh, you will not get investors yeah. into right. the country. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gide Ojo, Public Affairs uh, Commentator, for your submissions. Uh, Professor Uche Waleke, Professor of Capital Market, I want to thank you so much for um, your time and the for first your perspective. Professor of Capital Market. On these yeah. issues. Thank you so much, gentlemen, <laughs> for joining this program. And we will be going on a quick break now to reconvene at the top of the hour to continue with Daybreak. Stay with us.